very happy to be here. Seeing that crowd with smiling faces. There's also a lot, a lot of people have the hatta telling that I'm supporting the Palestinians. And sometimes we have to understand ourselves and much more is trying to figure out what's going on in the world around us. The idea that Sam started was a great idea and we as Nonviolence International support it and in the beginning we thought that he's crazy <laughs> and uh, it would not work. Yet he proved us wrong and we are thinking also not only to have it in Philadelphia that have been successful but the next place it will be in Atlanta, Georgia. And that will be something that will go in different cities, different places. Jews, Christians, and Muslims signing a commitment for peace, especially for children. I am a psychologist, putting myself so much for many, many, many years to work for the sake of children. And children who are abused, who are neglected. Also children who have been in the southern border between the United States and Mexico that have been taken away from their parents and I did program for them that we unite them again with their parents. Any children in the world, we go and find and work with those children. That's important. Then we have me as a child. My father was killed when I was five years old. We lost our home. And the Israelis put us on the wall and they said, we are going to shoot you. I have six more brothers and sisters and my grandmother and also my mother. If you don't leave the house, you are gone. You, you have 10 minutes. We didn't have any time to put extra clothes we didn't have even time to take our birth certificate or anything. That's when I was looking at a Gaza child or a family, I saw myself. We have to stay and outside, sleeping in the street, having no place to go to the bathroom, having no place to have water, after two weeks, a lady who is a Muslim by the name of Sithind al Husseini, she came to my mother and she said, I can't take the girls. I'm having a place for people who have been massacred at their Yassin, girls. And we have a school which is called Dar Tifil. It's okay to take your kids. She said, okay, but not for adoption. So she took the girls. Then another lady, she heard about Sithin taking those kids. Her name is Katie Antonios. Her husband is George Antonios, wrote the, a book, The Awa Arab Awakening. And she, he came to my mother. And she, my mother told the same thing. You can take my boys, but not adoption. So myself and my brother Bishara, we went 
to an orphanage. One of the things which have been difficult for me, I was a bully when I was young, very much. I was angry, I was frustrated, and I want to have a gun in my hand to see any Israeli, any Jew, any foreigner, anyone who gave money to kill me, to kill them. And my mother told me, I want one thing from you. I don't want you to carry a gun. I don't want you to kill anybody. And if you love me, that's the only condition I have for you. So I became a pacifist, thinking that it's as much as I am bullied, I would not carry a gun. Even in school, when they are training us, they put a gun in my hand, I refused, and everybody have to pass me and spit at me because I didn't carry a gun. So my interest was so long ago that if I don't carry a gun, I have a problem because how to get rid of this crazy occupation that we have. One of the things which I did, which is very easy for me, we became under the Jordanian. And I felt the Jordanian and the Israelis have something working together against the Palestinians. So I sent my passport after I have a passport to the king. I told him I don't want to be a Jordanian. I'm a Palestinian. <coughs> that makes me bad. And I was put in prison and I became a communist in the eyes of the Jordanian. So we have different sides of things. I came to the United States after the orphanage and uh, I hated every minute of it. I came to a college in Tennessee. The name of it is Lee College. And that Lee College, too, too much hallelujah and too much of uh, ugliness that they will feel that Blacks are not human beings. I sh should not talk to them. I should not go to the black church. I should not worship with them. I shouldn't do anything with blacks. And I say, what kind of a Christian are you? So I couldn't finish even the college. I have to leave and go back home again. And then after that, I was saved by people who are Mennonites. I'm not talking about bugs. I'm talking about a religious organization called Mennonites. And they, they told me, very, why you are spending your time here? You are a smart fellow. We could bring you to a Mennonite college. I say, sorry, I don't like America. <laughs> and the fellow, what he said, he said, if you come to America, I'll give you a card. And he really did. His name is Herman Hilty. He gave me a card. When I saw the card, it was old, old, old card. <laughs> and he told me that doesn't matter. As old as the car is, when I went to the United States, for anybody who gave me a car, it's good. He said, but I will fix it if you have any wrong with the car. However, the idea for a child to be hungry, it's so difficult. The idea that you go every day hunger is so amazing. What your body is telling you, what your mind tells you, and it's so difficult, everything. I was very fortunate. I went to that Mennonite 
college where they are Mennonites. And my gosh, I felt in love with that. They talk about peace, they talk about justice, they talk that I'm equal to everybody, and that became a very good sign for me. I'm a Palestinian, now I'm equal to everybody. Imagine that, to be a Palestinian, but I'm equal to everybody, and they put it in my head that I'm equal to everybody. And believe me, that makes me feel so good. So I went from one college to another mm -hmm. college, have a degree in social work, a degree in sociology, and I went also have a PhD in psychology. And then it hit me. I say, why I am here in the United States? I have to go back home. And I went home and I started to start a counseling center at home. And if you are a Palestinian starting a counseling center, that means you are crazy. <laughs> Nobody believes in counseling. Nobody's willing to pay you money. And if you have a doctor degree in psychology, they said, hey, you have doctor doctor degree, but in talking. <laughs> you cannot feel my finger, you cannot do anything to me as a doctor, so you have nothing. So I decided on the, that I will start a center, which is the Palestinian Center for the Study of Nonviolence. I really felt, in learning a lot from the Mennonites, that the Palestinian, we need a center for nonviolence. And I was able to get books about Gandhi, to translate books in Arabic, and for anybody, any school, any college, any group want to hear me, and I said, I'm going over there every place. I have very huge poster about this Gandhi who's skinny. I took it to all the villages. And I say, you see that skinny? He was able to liberate India. And we can, we are fat, and we could liberate <laughs> Palestine. <laughs> and it was a thing, they, they have no idea. They didn't hear even about Gandhi in some places. And I, and I went from one place to another, everybody said, oh, here is come Gandhi now. <laughs> He will tell us what this skinny man did. But I was very serious in it. And the first time I went and to speak about people here like you in the Palestinian, I put an ad in the newspaper. I put an ad in the English, the Arabic, and the Hebrew newspaper that I want to speak to end occupation. Oh. I went over there, I took the microphone, and the first thing I did, I said, we are under occupation because we choose to be under occupation. That's our choice. <laughs> and people like you listen to what? I said, if we resist occupation, we have to resist it every day. And we have, here are some of the ways to resist occupation. So many methods to resist occupation. Then we have a fellow by the name of Jean Sharp, if you are interested in nonviolence. He wrote a book, How to Resist Occupation. And I took a few here from this page to that page. Other things, I neglect them, and I said, that's a nice book about getting rid of occupation. Well, Jean Sharp came to visit me in Palestine, and he said, you are the most violent person I ever met. <laughs> you translate my book the way you want it without asking me. You didn't include everything I wrote, and you call yourself nonviolence. I said, sue me then. 
because in Palestine nobody saw anybody there. <laughs> he cannot win. <laughs> but I say sorry, and uh, he accepted that, and we became good friends until his death. And he helped us a lot to the point that I asked him who are the best people at that time who can speak about nonviolence, but we are going to take them to Arafat and his all the Abus in his group. Abus means the leaders of the PLO. And we went for one week and they look at me, you are crazy. You want to talk to us about nonviolence? I said, yes. I told them, I, I told them look at that fellow. Indian, so skinny. <laughs> he did it for India. We could do it for Palestine. And unfortunately, one was accepting the idea that Palestinians can use nonviolence. And he was assassinated from the leadership of Farafar. And that scared me to death. Why this nonviolence scaring people? And I thought people will take me as nonviolence is only for the weak, for those who have no understanding of things. But I felt it's my duty to tell even the leadership, to tell anybody who want to listen to me about nonviolence. For example, I'll give you two examples, then I will come to Gaza, because <laughs> that's important. One time, there's a group of villages in Palestine, and the Israelis came and uprooted olive trees, and they are thousand years old. Uproot them, just take them from those farmers. And we have to figure out what to do with those, with the people, how we could help those people. And the only thing I thought, okay, they took the olive trees, we'll bring olive seedling, and we plant olive trees. If they took 100, we plant 1,000. If they took 1,000, we plant 10,000 olive trees. But also I told them that <coughs> since we are planting trees, I like to ask you as people from the village that we want to include some Jews who are peaceful Jews who come and plant trees with us. And you have to think about it. It took two weeks to start thinking, yes, no, yes. But at least they agreed. Then after the agreement there, <coughs> I said, well, they will come and plant trees with us, but also they have to eat. And we have, we are inviting them. So they took three weeks more <laughs> to see if they have to cook for them and eat together. And believe me, when they plant those trees, we have to put two Palestinian, one foreigner, we call them foreigners, those people who come with us, being Israelis and European, and one Israeli together, to plant a tree as well as eating together. And this became a very big issue of the trees. Why we did that? Because we have to tell the Palestinian, at least you have other people who can look at you and support you in planting trees, even if it takes more than a few years to get olives on them. That's one part. The other part is that we find that those big olive trees, they went the Israeli took them and put them in a Martin Luther King Park. <laughs> so we went and 
said, well, what we could do? I mean, that's, that's an insult. <laughs> so we wrote to Coretta King, we wrote to the center in Atlanta and tell them, hey, you know, at least do something about it. So we get letters from the farmers, from the village, that those olive trees are from us dedicated to Martin Luther King. And we have to explain to them who is Martin Luther King. <laughs> <laughs> and that also became another education thing. And we start writing about Martin Luther King, about what he's doing, and how he was able to change the United States here in America, that equality is an important thing and justice is an important thing. And if you are a Palestinian, you have to demand justice and equality. And then I came and visited Atlanta and went to Mrs. King and she said, we can't do anything about it, but at least we heard about it. And she wrote me a very nice letter that we accept those trees to be part from the Palestinians. Mm. <clears throat> now coming on Gaza. We have to start thinking in new ways. We really have to learn, we all have to learn from the Palestinians. Even we have more than 32,000 Palestinian dead, destruction, but we have to learn from them. You know that if a fellow have a soup in his hand or rice or a bag of wheat or flour and he is going away with it and he wants to take it to his family. Everybody is hungry. Nobody attacked him and took the food from him. Nobody. This by itself showed the humanity of those people. He's hungry, they are hungry, but that's his. his. You cannot imagine how much faith that the people in Gaza have. With all what happened, everything what happened, they all say, say one thing, that's the will of God. And if you are a foreigner, if you are angry, if you are upset, say what is the will of God when you are killed, how many of you killed, what, where is God in this? It's the will of God. That's our faith. They pray for the dead and they go on. It's very sad. So I'm as a psychologist, I have a problem with that because I have myself trauma when I saw my father dead and I have to bury them in a house, in our house. I'm 80 years old and I still struggle with seeing my father's death. So how many of those children in Gaza from generation to generation to another generation have trauma and we have to help them? Not only I'm thinking of helping the people in Gaza, but also I feel sorry for the Israeli soldiers. They are 18, 19, 20. They go and shoot those people. They kill them, they destroy their houses. They just, the people have, hey, no place to go to the bathroom. They have not, no food, nothing. And those soldiers, one time they need help. And they need a lot of help from the international community, from all social workers and sociologists and everybody. Because that's important. <coughs> because they will live a miserable life and we don't want them to live a miserable life. 
we have to say that's wrong and somebody has to talk with the Israeli, with the government, that what you are doing to your own people is wrong. And that is a way of saying we are all a human being. United States, you know, Israel is that small. United States is that big. And yet that small Israel tell you not said what to do, what's wrong in a society like that. If something wrong happened to the state of Israel as a government, as people, as those who believe in Judaism, they cannot think anymore like all Jews have to think of equality, of justice, of right. So how we could help them, it becomes an important thing. And many times you could see that a president or a prime minister of, of uh, Northern Ireland will come to the White House, openly he said to Biden, cease fire. <coughs> he be on the radio and television in front of Biden. We need cease fire. All the states, everybody, Biden, we need cease fire. All the Christians, all churches, everybody, we need cease fire. He said, yeah, we, have, we, we think of Gaza people who think that uh, they should not be in that position. But cease fire is important to stop the killing. What is also happening in the United States? Where is your feeling for the person who are down, who have been hit badly, and saying that we have to be with you, we have to lift you up. Then South Africa came. With all their apartheid history and with all their difficulty, they said we are going to the International Court of Justice to save the Palestinians. My gosh, that brought the spirit up for the Palestinians. Even the people who are dead <laughs> might say thank you for South Africa. Yes. Why not Canada did that? Why not Britain did that? Why not all other countries did that? Because they felt the oppression and they don't want to see other people have the same way that they felt it. And God bless Mandela. In this thing, what happened also, we have so many times that we failed as Palestinians in the UN. Suddenly, the UN we went and asked for ceasefire. We were not defeated. We got a lot of votes. But we have one country veto it. Guess who that country is? United States. We did it again, we did it again, and the United States vetoed it. And at the end, one time, they didn't veto it, and the United States abstained. And that was a success and heroic thing for the Palestinians. We did it, we did it, we can do it, and we can do it again. And now what we are doing in the UN is that we are asking that the UN will accept Palestine as a permanent member of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. When we are talking about justice, when we are talking about, I don't know if when Michael came, he had this Adela on his shirt. If the United States want peace in the Middle East, they have to recognize that Palestinians and Israelis have to be treated the same thing with the United States. Can America do that? Can United States policy do that? Can 
can American churches do that to treat Palestinians and Israeli the same? If they don't treat that, we continue having that conflict. We cannot go to October 7 or go back to October 6 for the siege of Gaza. We cannot do that. We have to have a new way of dealing with this issue. Not only the United States is bad, Egypt is one of the worst Arab countries. If Egypt opened the border for all the trucks inside to go to Gaza, we don't have so many people starving or going to death. There's something going in Egypt that we don't understand. Arab countries, Muslim countries, they talk good, they talk very good. <laughs> But there's no action from them. And we have, as Palestinians, we have to have action. Also, the idea of one state or two states, I don't know if you know Dahoud Kutab who came to introduce me. He is for two states. But look at his brother, Jonathan. He wrote a book for one state. <laughs> So, so even, even there's a division in the family, <laughs> which one is better or not. But it's not a matter of one state or two states. We need justice. And for Palestinians to say, oh, it worked, it doesn't work, believe me, you here gave a good example that it worked. We have to adjust our feelings our right, our relationship, our anger, our frustration, our hate. And from hate that we have to change it to love. And if we change that, then take it step by step, okay? For a while, believe me, I told Sam he's crazy. I still say that he's still crazy, <laughs> but having that with Palestinians and Israel to work together, it is not craziness. The Israeli cannot kill us all. They can. I mean, we are like rabbits. <laughs> we have kids, we have babies, we have, with everything, we still have, we still have babies. Even in that, I don't know how many babies during those four months or five months happened. But to create that image, Israel is not making friends with us. It makes it more enemies. And if we think that, or anybody say, well, Hamas is a terrorist organization. Well, Lakud is a terrorist organization. <laughs> Why wouldn't say Lakud is a terrorist and Hamas is a terrorist and let them sit together and talk together? They might take the word terrorist out of it. And they, and they could make ways on that. We cannot support a country that kills children. We cannot support a country as Americans that destroy all churches, mosques, hospitals, you name it, it's destroyed. We cannot support a country that wants to eliminate a whole generation of people. <coughs> Yet, believe me, when there will be peace with the Palestinian and with the Israelis, Palestinian will accept it. Mm. Knowing Palestinian, they will accept peace. Mm. Because also, that figure out how Sam was able to have Jews and Muslim and Christian together and he make it a success. So over there and here and everywhere, when we really put our faith in front of us, not our ideology, then we are we will do good. Thank you all for hearing me and good luck for everybody.